image of like, <laughs> when most people think of data science, I imagine most of them think of math and numbers kind of floating around in the clouds, or at least that's what one of my friends told me recently. He said, I don't know what you do, but I imagine, you know, numbers floating in the clouds. And I said, you know what, that's, that sounds greatly. <laughs> but when I think about data science, I think about people and how I can help people. So this is a picture of the AVMA, American Veterinary Medical Association, economics division where I work. And this was at a team building session when we could all meet safely in person without masks. So obviously pre-COVID, great, fantastic times. So I'm really blessed to work with really smart people, including PhDs in economics. And we all come from a variety of different backgrounds. And it really takes all of us working together in order to solve problems and really make this data science magic happen. So it, it's really all the diversity of skills that we bring to the table that helps us all um, be effective, which I think is one of the great strengths of data science. So a little bit about me. Oh, I guess I should click the got it. Um, so when uh, I first entered the job market, data science wasn't really a thing. Remote work wasn't very common. Um, I had started at this credit union that I've worked at through high school and also through college. I was doing analytics and reporting, and eventually I started working for companies headquartered in Pennsylvania and now Chicago. So throughout that time, I've worked in finance, I worked in telecommunications, I've worked in weather and media, and now I work for an association in the medical field. So really my journey to data science has allowed me to work with a lot of talented people and to do the type of work I love I get to help others and I get to support my family. So some of the cool people that I've got to work with, you can see that bottom picture, Pam and Dallas. So that's us showing off our Wonder Woman uh, bracelets. And then at the top, of course, I have to show off my cute little six month old. I love taking pictures of him, you know, especially by my garden. And then in the middle is my husband and our 16 year old at Yosemite. So one of the things that I love to do is travel. So I've been really blessed that my career in data science has allowed me to do all of these things. So, but you know, today I'm not just here to talk about friends and family, although I could share pictures all day long. <laughs> so today I'm gonna really share with you my experience in data science, my journey, and how you might be able to use um, data science um, in your career, whether you're starting out or you've been doing data science for a while. Hopefully you will learn something new. So first thing I think it's important to consider is that data science, it's really diverse and it's an ever-growing field. So a lot of times people have a hard time defining it. One of the definitions I've heard that kind of gives me a chuckle is, people who are better at statistics than programmers, but they're also better at programming than statisticians. <laughs> so you're, you're a little bit better than either, you kind of play in both spaces, but really it's a fun and growing field and there's plenty of room for more people to enter the field. So there's lots of ways where you can find out, you know, where you fit in. So today I'm gonna go over um, three kind of main uh, recommendations. So um, one, it's to really learn multiple technologies. Um, two, don't be afraid to integrate, you know, subject matter expertise. And then three, really um, help people find solutions. So data science, it's full stack in nature. So it's important to take educational opportunities. And data science is more than just data. So it's really important to work on non-technical skills as well as technical. And data science is about solving problems. So you really wanna network with people from diverse skill sets. So let's dive into this. First, we're gonna go over um, some of the technologies. Since data science is full stack in nature, there's a lot of different opportunities to learn different technologies. Now, a lot of times we've heard about this term, uh, the unicorn. Some people describe the best data scientists as unicorns <laughs> due to the breadth and depth um, of knowledge that they have. 
So, and this is why the position usually commands very high pay and it's in demand. Everyone's looking for full stack, but that can take on many different flavors. So this doesn't mean that you have to create an entire machine learning application from the messiest of data to the prettiest interface all on your own. But if you can, you're definitely a unicorn. Technology is always evolving. So it's really important to brush up on the latest technologies and the latest skills. And full stack can mean different things to different people in different companies. So we'll talk about that um, a little bit later. But in general, it's just really important to take advantage of any type of educational opportunity that you have in order to increase um, your technical skills in your tech stack. So I really think of data science as these three main buckets of skills. And so a lot of times for the technical skills, we think about computer science and we think about statistics. So that's where most of the you know, technology comes into play. So for computer science, this is things like you know, coding, automation, putting things into production. Um, it could even be, you know, front end design um, for some of these different, you know, computer science skills um, that help data scientists really become effective. Um, but also statistics. Now, statistics are really key to analyzing and forecasting. This is where, you know, I, I really kind of started. So this can include all different types of statistics. So Anything from basic descriptive statistics like frequencies, mean or median, all the way to t-test, ANOVA, multivariate regression, and of course, what everyone's always talking about, machine learning. So doing things like decision trees, um, random forest, you know, all of this stuff um, is important in the statistics uh, bucket. But I think one of the things that a lot of times people don't think about or maybe overlook is really the importance of subject matter expertise. So this can include any area that's really relevant to your job or to the project you're working on. So right now I work in an association in the medical field. So um, having an understanding um, or medical background um, can really be helpful. Also, I've worked in you know, retail before, a lot of our members are veterinarians that own practices. So understanding some of these basic business concepts, um, you know, around sales, marketing, uh, finance, uh, customer segmentation, all of that has helped me um, in my role as I'm going through and doing all those types of analysis and creating data science products and services. And then um, also I have a background in sociology. So social science has helped me, especially when I'm looking at data related to people. It's really hard to predict human behavior. So having a background in psychology, sociology, political science, just any type of social science, I think a lot of times comes in really handy for some of these big uh, problems that people are looking to data scientists to solve. And then geography, I'm gonna talk about that a lot. It comes into play over and over, especially when you're looking at data across multiple locations. So if you're in the US, just looking at data across the US, or it could even be looking at data internationally or across the globe. So having an understanding of geography um, can really help you um, in those types of situations. So now that we've looked at those three buckets, let's dive a little bit deeper into technologies. So when I started uh, many years ago, <laughs> I was only using SPSS and Excel, but the field is constantly changing and evolving. You know, now cloud technologies are becoming more and more relevant and having experience with different types of databases and distributive computing platforms is more important than ever. Uh, right now, I work a lot in the Microsoft stack um, using Azure environments. But in the past, I've worked with AWS and with Google Cloud Services. So um, being able to understand one or multiple um, cloud technologies um, can really help you out. Um, and then also, people are going more and more to open source. So understanding things like R and Python can be very important. Um, Python is becoming pretty popular, almost more popular than some of the traditional software packages like SAS, SPSS, and Stata. And even then, uh, more and more platforms are looking at how they can integrate these languages into their systems. But for any type of location, 
based problems, um, GIS can be really important. So this could mean using the Esri stack like ArcGIS, ArcMap and Pro, using QGIS or some other type of um, open source platform, not only to analyze the data, but also to visualize it. Many people love maps. So, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, this is very true, even in data science, being able to take everything that you've done and visualize it in a compelling manner. A lot of times people on the analysis side, um, you know, can have problems in this because they get so into the analysis and every little facet. So it's really important to be able to use uh, different types of visualization platforms and software. So things like Power BI or Tableau, being able to create really compelling visuals, interactive dashboards, um, things that make your data come to life and allow people to play with the data. I mean, inevitably, you're going to use Excel. Um, you're going to use PowerPoint like I am today. <laughs> so, you know, Excel is not like the deepest of data science tools, but inevitably, you're probably going to use it for something at some point. But really, it's also important to keep yourself organized. So using uh, things like GitHub and Jira, backing up your work. Oh my gosh, we've always had those times where you've worked for like two hours, you forgot to save, you didn't commit, something happens and you lose your work. We've all been there. <laughs> but the more you can prevent that from happening, the more effective and the better you're better off you're going to be. So using things like Slack, Jira, GitHub, all of that, you know, is important. Staying organized, documenting, being able to work, you know, in a really good team environment. And then next, we're going to talk about subject matter teams, because again, data science is more than just data. It really includes working on a non-technical skill. Now, with subject matter expertise, this is one of the fun parts, because you really get to use non-technical skills, interests, and experiences. So think about you know, what you're interested in. Back in 2006, I thought I was going to save the world. Um, me and my grad mates there at the top left, that's a picture of us celebrating um, after our thesis defense. Um, I was really passionate about social inequality, and I thought I was going to immediately go out and save the world. And early on, I can remember times where I felt like I was doing TPS reports. <laughs> I mean, you just wonder if you're ever going to get to those initial things that you know you went out to do. I know one of the biggest frustrations data scientists have is that their work is not always you know used so you know everyone has these struggles but along the way i gained a lot of great experience i got to learn about finance operations sales marketing um, at one point i even got to do political work in dc and now i've gotten back to the things that i was first passionate about so i get to work on areas such as the gender pay gap and I get to work on issues related to animal welfare and the environment. So sometimes, you know, it, it takes a while to really build up that book of experience, you know, to get those projects that, you know, you really love and you're really passionate at and that people are going to take and they're really going to, you know, run with. So one of the things that I'm most proud of is being able to really come kind of full circle. So now I'm working on things like the gender pay gap and student loan debt. These are issues that I began exploring in college, um, even doing peer reviewed journal publications. That's something that I haven't done since grad school. And now working at the American Veterinary Medical Association, um, I get to work on you know, both of those things. And you know, it's funny, I've also used some of my early career experience in operations and finance um, in my current role. So we were working on a project to look at student loan debt and financial counseling. And I never thought, you know, more than 10 years ago when I was working at these financial literacy camps, you know, in the summer outside teaching kids about financial literacy and 90 degree heat, that that would come into play, you know, later on in a data science role. But sure enough, it did when we were trying to, um, you know, design uh, an experiment to look at the impact of um, financial education on decision making. So really all of these experiences from some of my first jobs to even um, working at AccuWeather, looking at, you know, partnerships, um, also my work in telecommunications, like at Cox Communications, um, providing, you know, reports to executives. Um, that's something that's carried with me, you know, throughout my career. So a lot of these experiences 
um, you know, it may not be something that people think of at first for data science, but data science has played into um, to all of these. So really, data science is also about solving problems. So we really need to make sure that you network with people from a diverse set of skills. So I'm going to share with you some of the ways that I've used data science to find solutions and how networking with um, others and increasing my skill set has really helped um, in that area. So really, this is where we kind of get into that concept of data science being full stack. Now, there's three different kind of steps to this process. The first is data. Uh, the second is analysis. And the last step is communicating those insights. So the first step when you're looking at data, a lot of times people think of this as traditional like DBA positions. So this could be you know, database administration, database management, data engineering. And some companies I've seen them have data engineers and then also data scientists. So when you see something like that, usually it means that the data engineers fall heavier on the data side. They um, may understand the next steps in the process for analysis and insights, but they're really working on prepping, cleaning, piping the data um, for the data scientists. Then the next step in the analysis part, that's where you get into more of the analyst roles or what you might think of as the data scientist role if it's separated from the data engineer. This is where your statistics come into play, uh, machine learning, spatial analytics. Now, inevitably, data never comes to us completely clean. It's not like data magically appears in this beautiful, clean format. There's a lot of management cleaning and piping that has to happen in that first data part. But when you're going through the actual analysis, when you're developing models, you need to re-clean the data. You may need to do more transformations. You may have to do non-linear transformations, create you know additional categories. Um, you may want to segment out your samples for testing and training. So all of these things really lend itself towards that cleaning process. So either you have to do it yourself or you have to go back to the data people um, and ask them to kind of clean the data for you. So this is where it really helps to at least play in multiple of these areas or to be able to network um, and work with other people in a team environment who are heavier in this area. So if you're heavier in um, analysis, you know, start to learn a little bit on the data side or make friends with that really awesome data engineer. Or if you're a data engineer that wants to play more in analysis, become you know, best friends with that statistician. But there's also that third step of providing insights. And this is where it becomes pretty difficult, especially if you're from like a highly technical background, because a lot of times with this data science work, you have to communicate it to a decision maker. So this could be an executive or a leader, someone who's not technical in nature, or it could be a salesperson that has to sell a product or someone in marketing that has to market the product or service that you have produced. So a lot of times we can think of the insights um, as more like business intelligence with visualization or reporting or traditional you know, marketing and communication. One of the problems that people often have is they jump from data to insights. So if you have historical sales data and you're just visualizing that data over time, that's telling you what happens, but it's not telling you what's going to happen. You know, you, is, is the line going to go on the same trend? Or are you just going to, you know, look at it and see it go up? You don't know. Why did it go up or down? This is where analysis comes into play. And that's the importance of being able to really do statistical analysis um, effectively because you can't have predictions, you can't have prescriptive insights unless you do that middle layer of the analysis, but it's nothing without data. So you really have to have all three steps in that process to successfully go, um, to go through it. So ideally you wanna have good experience in all three of these areas, but again, you may be a little bit heavier in one area um, than the other. So at some point, you're going to be working with someone else who's a little bit deeper in one of these areas 
or you're going to be handing off um, you know, to another person. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the data science projects you know, that I've worked on. So there's really kind of three buckets that you can think about for this. So the first one is content and insights. So a lot of the projects that I've worked on here, things like providing our members or our customers with insights on economic trends. Since I'm in the economics division at AVMA, this tends to come up a lot. Also information on customer base. This comes up with now in my current role and pretty much every company that I've worked at. Everyone wants to know um, what their customers are, are doing and thinking. And they just want to understand, get more insights about their business to make you know, better decisions all the way from you know mid-level managers all the way to the very top and then also increasing revenue is another really important key area so i've done um, projects in the past looking at optimizing advertising uh, what types of ads to place when to place them uh, looking at the sales cycle um, so how are different you know environmental factors or economic factors going to um, influence a company's sales and also developing new products and services. This is a huge growing area for data science and AI in general. It's developing uh, new products and services for businesses so that they can really leverage data and monetize it to strengthen their business. And then lastly, forecasting. So everyone wants to know the future, <laughs> making predictions on things like the weather, making predictions on you know, members or customers, um, predicting, you know, revenue and expenses, you know, especially with COVID-19 uh, happening and the pandemic hit, everyone wanted to know what economists thought. So, um, you know, it's a really good area to work in with economics and data science in order to help people um, because people really needed a lot of good um, information on what was going to happen. And so having a background in economics and data science really helps provide insights for you know, what's going to happen for business revenue um, and expenses. So a few different examples of content and insights. One of the things that um, I've been working on at the American Veterinary Medical Association are information on pet ownership and segments. So really, you know, who are different types of pet owners? Like how would you classify them and what are their needs? So this is really good, important information for you know our members who own uh, practices so we found out that each group really differs in their demographic makeup how involved they are with their pets and how much they spend so we collect um, a lot of data on um, you know our members we collect survey data um, on pet owners and so uh, it was one job to help you know collect that data design surveys um, along with um, my coworkers and to translate that into insights. So doing traditional market segmentation, clustering techniques, but also doing predictions as to which one of these segments um, are most at risk for you know, rating um, you know, their experience at the veterinarian low or high based on you know, certain things um, you know, that happen during that visit. So we found one group like Pamper pets, they have the highest spending and level of involvement. These are the people that buy fashion accessories for their pets. They think about their pet's happiness, their mental well being every day. Um, they're most likely single with no children, and they have plenty of time to devote to their pets. And then we found another group casual caretakers, married with children, they have higher income levels, and they have the lowest involvement and spending on their pets. So each of these different groups, some of them are looking for um, you know, convenience. Some of them are more concerned with having, you know, um, a veterinarian and technicians that are very knowledgeable and experienced. Um, sometimes they're looking for more customized recommendations. So we need to be able to segment out um, all of those different um, customer groups, help our members identify those groups, and then also on top of that, um, help them modify their messaging, their marketing, and their customer service experience um, based on the types of segments that they're serving. So knowing which group their clients fit into really help them foster successful relationships and in turn increase their profitability. 
So another example of content and insights um, that I worked on for the AVMA was providing insights to the public and to veterinarians about COVID-19. So when COVID-19 hit, um, the AVMA was um, considered a very good trusted source of information on the pandemic. So I worked with a coworker who had a lot of good expertise in GIS and also other coworkers in marketing, communications, digital media, and we were able to work together to produce these um, interactive maps where you could hover over it and you could see data um, streamed in from Johns Hopkins University on COVID cases um, overlaid with veterinary practice um, locations. So people were getting good information, up-to-date information on COVID cases, social vulnerability, and a whole host of other factors. We also launched a survey to ask practice owners how they were being impacted by the pandemic. So we could see how, you know, location, size of practice, uh, what um, type of staffing levels you have, um, what types of patients you have, how all of these things um, impact uh, how you are affected by COVID-19. And then we could take it a step further to predict which businesses um, would be the most vulnerable and which ones um, would be uh, most um, able to weather um, the pandemic. So this helped us provide that information back to practice owners so that they could implement strategies to help them, you know, better weather the pandemic financially and to help, you know, continue to provide really valuable services for their customers um, and for their patients. So one of the ways we delivered this information was through an interactive dashboard. So if you were in the Midwest, you could look at data that was specific to your location in the Midwest, or if you wanted to look at rural or companion animal practices, you could view that information that was relevant to you. So providing um, the information in an interactive dashboard made it easier um, for our members to really get those insights that were important to them. And this was a big you know, leap for our organization because previously um, we would publish these 150 page PDF reports that were really text heavy and it had tons of great information, but you know, not everyone has time to read through 150 pages of text. So we're constantly looking at ways in which we can take all of this really complicated, you know, economic <laughs> analysis and translate it down into something that's um, really easily digestible, you know, for our members. So one of the other areas to look at is forecasting. And really with forecasting, there's endless opportunities. Because like I said, everyone wants to know the future, you know, they, from everything from how's the economy going to, you know, who should I pick for fantasy football? Everybody wants to know the future. So it's really cool to work in data science because you can do a lot of great um, forecasting to, you know, help businesses and to help people. So since I work in the economics division, uh, one of the things that we get asked a lot is what's going to happen with the economy specific to practice owners, to veterinary medicine, and just in general. We want to know what types of products and services people are going to be buying. So right now for my role at the AVMA, that's what is the demand for veterinary care and for pet services and pet products. Um, but in every previous job, it's been, you know, really forecasting, you know, how weather is going to impact consumers, what types of um, financial products people want. So this is something that comes up, you know, time and time again. And of course, you know, every business wants to know, are sales going to increase or decrease uh, next quarter? So there's a lot of great opportunities for data science to help organizations. But one of the projects that I'm most proud of is working on uh, tornado outbreaks. So uh, my team was able to predict tornado outbreaks months in advance at AccuWeather um, using data, statistical models, and spatial analytics to, and also visualization tools. So we basically created this um, tool that allowed forecasters to um, utilize their previous process in a way that was um, more accurate and more efficient to predict where tornado outbreaks were going to occur. So in order to do that, we had to work really closely um, with meteorologists to understand their process and to understand 
you know, what goes into forecasting. And so we translated that into a series of algorithms and into a tool that they could actually have some, you know, control over. And in the end, we found like in this picture where you can see in dark red, um, that's where we were predicting tornado risk to be highest. And then all of the little dashes in black were where tornado outbreaks actually occurred. So it ended up being, you know, very highly accurate. So being able to work with, you know, someone with a different skill set like meteorologist and to provide a tool that helps them become more effective, but also a tool that can, you know, help save lives is, you know, really rewarding experience. And then also, you know, increasing revenue, of course, you know, this is the key to success um, in many cases for many jobs um, that you'll work with for many businesses. So really, you want to think about, you know, what problem are you trying to solve? How are you going to operationalize it? And who will you work with to make it happen? So a lot of times as data scientists, you know, we love machine learning models. We love doing statistic analysis. I mean, who doesn't love a great regression with awesome p values, you know, but <laughs> at the end of the day, what's going to happen with it? Who's going to use it? And this goes back to one of the biggest frustrations that data scientists have is people not using the work that they do. So, you know, if you're doing something like, you know, predicting CPI rates or predicting, you know, when people are going to click on an ad, well, if you can predict it, you know, what are you going to do? Can you actually change your campaign on the fly? If you know you've done image recognition analysis and you know certain images are more effective, who are you going to work with to actually implement that to change the images on the fly to increase um, those rates and to increase uh, revenue? If you're looking at things like, you know, Next Best Cross Sale, one of the first projects that I worked on early in my career, um, I looked at all of the information that we had for our customers, um, including what types of products and services they had, their demographic information, you know, location, things like that. And, you know, we we're able to come up with um, a prediction of, all right, this person is more likely to get an auto loan in the next six to 12 months, or maybe they're more likely to get a checking account. So next time they're in, if you're going to offer them a service, this is the one to offer. Well, you can create this model, you can come up with the algorithm, but how do you push that, you know, to the people that are actually interacting with your members and how do you get them to use it? So actually for this, um, it, it was funny, I got to utilize one of my other um, subject areas, which is baking. I love to bake cookies and bake cakes. So one of the ways we tested this was, all right, everybody at these three branches, we did a pilot and we said, um, if you go and utilize this next best cross sell model to try to sell, whoever increases brings in the most revenue, like I'll bake you whatever cookies and cakes that you want. And we ended up bringing in, I think it was like 2 million and it was for just like a local credit union. So that was a lot of money for them. So never underestimate the influence of baked goods on the data science process. <laughs> so, you know, really you have to consider who are the people that are going to be using this how do you convince them to use it? And how do you make sure that it's successful? So this is also the key for, you know, creating new products. Um, also things like if you're looking at potential revenue loss, how do you head that off at the pass? Like if you're predicting valid versus, you know, invalid truck rolls, um, recently I've looked at drill bit changes, um, you know, helping out a friend. Um, there's all different types of things you can look at for decreasing revenue, but you have to go back into operations and ensure that they're actually going to utilize that information, make decisions based on it, um, and put that back into the feedback loop. So at the end, you know, remember, you're always working with people. So there's going to be someone that you have to convince to use what you're building, and you have to show them why they should do it and how it can help them. So really, you know, just a few things to keep in mind. Um, one, you know, learn multiple technologies. Um, you know, really data science is full stack in nature. So take any educational opportunities that you get and also work on those non-technical skills. You want to integrate subject matter expertise because data science is more than just data. And also network with people from diverse backgrounds. I know a lot of times, you know, technical people and then sales and marketing people can seem like oil in, in vinegar and have very different, you know, personality traits and ways of working. But 
some of the most successful projects that I've worked on have been, you know, people, technical people like myself working alongside salespeople and working alongside, you know, marketing professionals. Or if you're, you know, really deep into statistics, less on the data management side, you know, become best friends with that data engineer. Or if you're a lighter on the visuals, you know, work with uh, someone who's really great at graphic design. So um, again, network with um, all of these people to help find solutions, because at the end of the day, data science is really about solving problems. So with that, I really wish you all luck on your data science journeys, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. And if anyone can't unmute and ask questions, feel free to put in the chat and we'll bring it up. What are you learning right now, Rosemary? Or what are you excited about that's coming out in the field? So um, right now, actually today, um, we were looking at doing, um, building a data portal. So um, I'm looking at different types of Power BI technology. So we might be looking at using Power BI embedded in order to deliver um, you know, our data to our users um, in like a more interactive manner. But I think there's a lot of cool stuff coming out with um, like image recognition, like more on the AI side. So I think especially for the field of medicine, there's a lot of cool stuff um, that's going to be coming out down the pipe um, using AI. Like I've had a few people pinging me about that lately. So, um, you know, it's pretty cool. It's always, you know, ever growing. Um, there's always something interesting to work on. But right now, mostly, um, you know, looking at providing more insights to um, all of the veterinarians and AVMA members out there. So we're doing a lot of digital transformation. Yeah, and math. <laughs> um, digital transformation to, um, you know, really make sure that what we're providing, people can digest it a lot easier than like a 100 plus page um, PDF. No one likes scrolling through 100 pages of PDF. <laughs> yeah. Visualization is definitely a lot easier to get people to look at and interact with. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny because um, I actually always loved art um, as a kid and in high school, um, I'd actually thought about, you know, becoming an artist, like having a career in art. I had an art teacher that was, um, you know, convincing me to go down that path and I didn't, but I feel like sometimes when I'm working, you know, with marketing and I'm working on these visuals, I'm like, oh, what are, what are the color combinations I have to work with? And I just, I love playing with those visuals, especially on mapping can be really fun in particular. So I, I get more on my, you know, creative side, like the state of profession report we're getting ready to release. It's very infographic heavy. So I really loved working with the um, graphic design team. They produced some really cool, um, beautiful visuals. So it's it's fun to get to play in that space. It helps my, um, was it the, the left brain side or the right brain side? I forget which one is the creative one. Yeah, I guess the right brain is creative. But right brain creative, yeah. Yeah, so it much. sounds like there's a lot of intersection. Like you leverage all of your experiences and bring it into your work. Yeah, and you know, that's the great thing about data science. I feel like it's it's such a diverse skill set. You get to work with so many different people and so many different problems. Um, I mean, it's it's just amazing, like the things that you can do to help all different types of people in different situations. Um, you know, I, I didn't think that I would be able to eventually get into something where, you know, I'm helping helping people, you know, better care for animals. So, you know, it's really it's rewarding. So Rosemary, I have a quick question. I, I even raised my hand. I was so happy to be up. Oh, <laughs> I see now. Yes. <laughs> um, do you think, it sounds like to me that this field will just continue to um, be probably one of the most important uh, roles within an organization as we're able to use like AWS and Azure um, and we're able to like do AI recognition and such. Do you see that as just continuing to grow and, um, you know, that 
that this would be if you could say like for myself I'm, I wish I could start all over again like would <laughs> even if I could and I can would this be a great field to actually start to look into definitely and um, I've tried to tell my teenager that I don't think he's going to go into it <laughs> he's actually leaning more towards uh, you know sociology and social uh, sciences but it's it's such a great in-demand field you know, there's so many people looking for data scientists, analysts, people who understand how to leverage data. I mean, early on in my career, it seemed like people were just kind of starting to talk about data. And then they were talking about big data, but people were still kind of trying to save data <laughs> and get a hold of it. And then people were trying to like visualize data, but then now people are starting to realize, oh, we can actually do predictions off of data. So the interest level that people have right now is far exceeding, um, you know, the labor force skill set, and that doesn't look like there's any sign of that changing a, for the near term or even the long term. Um, you know, there's going to continue to be more technology, more opportunities, there's gonna be more advances in data analysis, um, AI. So demand is just gonna keep growing um, in this area. So anybody who has like a, a passion and even a little bit of an aptitude for it, I would highly encourage them to consider a career in data science. And you don't have to start trying to be a unicorn from the start and mastering everything. You know, you could pick just one area that you're interested in first and eventually try to grow your skill set over time, um, which is, you know, what I've done. It's, it's taken, you know, over a decade for me to amass a lot of these, you know, life experiences and professional experiences that, you know, help me with my day-to-day -day job. But I feel just really grateful and blessed to be in this industry, this profession, and this type of work, because it's, just really great challenging work and you know it's it pays well and I can support my family so you know helping people and supporting your family is two great things that was my next question does it pay well but yeah <laughs> it does increasing and you know it's like anytime you're in a really good field you kind of wonder is this really gonna is this really gonna last and is this really gonna be that great and like the job just keeps getting better and better and the opportunities just keep getting, you know, better and better. So yeah, I, I definitely encourage people to go into it. I'm super happy with it. I mean, I worked at other jobs, like don't even come close, like working at a call center. Whew, man, that was tough work, you know? <laughs> so I feel really blessed to, uh, to be where I'm at. Um, just one more question. And, um, have you had any mentorship on your journey or did you have any sponsors helping you get there? Definitely. I couldn't have gotten to where I'm at without a lot of really great mentorship um, along the way. So um, one of my first jobs um, at Meritrust Credit Union, uh, Jamie Harrison was really great along the way. Um, and I'm still in contact with her. In fact, I didn't see her this weekend. She provided some great mentorship um, and advice throughout my career. Um, and then I had a really great um, manager when I was at Cox Communications, uh, Laura, she was absolutely fantastic, great to work with. Um, she made sure when I did work, like she brought me with her to meetings, you know, with executives so that I could show my work and I got experience, you know, um, speaking with executives and learning how to, you know, communicate um, your work effectively. And then um, when I was at AccuWeather, um, Maurice Fett was just absolutely amazing um, mentor uh, for me. So she um, actually uh, got me into Half the Sky Leadership Training, which is also um, a great program. I'd highly recommend Grace Kilalea um, does that. But um, Marie was really great, um, you know, for mentoring me and giving me advice and making sure that I had opportunities um, to grow um, in my role. So one of the things that I'm passionate to is helping others, mentoring people. I know, Pam, you're the same way. So um, one of my greatest joys, especially at AccuWeather, was hiring people, building a team, bringing in interns. And now it's been so long, I've seen them grow in their careers and be able to do work that they love and and make a great living so 
um, you know, I've been helped and now I've also been able to um, help others. And that's some of the best, most, you know, rewarding experience in your career is, you know, being able to help others. Oh, how to convince people what they uh, need, um, what we built. So this is a great question. Um, so one of the first things that I do, especially if I come into a new job, is you know try to get the lay of the land. What are the big problems that people are trying to solve? And you just let people talk. People love talking about the problems and talking about you know like what's just like driving them nuts, what problem they need to solve. So just really listen to people. And then, you know, a lot of times it's just brainstorming like, well, if you were to have this, so what would you, what would you say, would that be helpful? And a lot of times like, oh yeah, that would be great. That would be um, amazing. So like with um, some of the work I've done at AVMA, I said, well, you know, we could do this report or what if I presented this report as an interactive dashboard? Like what if instead of this chart in Excel, you could click a button and you could see it now for like companion animal medicine, or you could see it for rural versus urban, like, oh my gosh, that would be like the best thing since, you know, sliced bread. Or what if I could give you an algorithm that predicts, you know, who's likely to stay a member for several years or who's most at risk of leaving? Um, would that be helpful for you since you're concerned about, you know, member attrition? Oh my gosh, that would be great. Well, how would how would you use that if I were to provide it to you? So really it's just kind of thinking through what you might build, what does the outcome look like? And then talking with the stakeholders and making sure, hey, would you actually use this? You know, would this be helpful? How would you use it? And just really talking it through. So just something as simple as listening. And you know, sometimes you got to get creative. Like I said, with that next best, you know, cross sale, people are like, eh. You know, a few people were like, I don't know. I think we just, we just know. Like, I, I just know my customers. Like, I don't know that I need, you know, data to, pr to predict that. So I said, you know what? What's the harm if we do a little pilot? I'll bake some, you know, cookies and we'll just see how it goes. And sure enough, it went great. So sometimes you got to, you know, break out the cookie sheet and bake them some chocolate chip cookies. But <laughs> I find that, you know, listening is a good, really good first step. And thank you, Pam, for, oh, you're welcome. Yeah, and thanks, Pam, for sharing the, um, sharing that link. Any other questions, burning questions that you'll have? She's quite approachable. I am. <laughs> I try. I try to be. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm so glad that you found it helpful. I, I love, um, you know, sharing insights, especially if it can be helpful, you know, to other people. You know, it's like, it's great when you love, you know, what you do, because then you can just talk about it all day long so <laughs> yeah thank you for joining us today rosemary this is a really great talk thank you yeah i'm so happy to be here i love um the organization and what you do i mean women who code it's just absolutely great organization oh someone else had a question I'm glad you got more insight yeah, into what the field is about. And I, I think we're all trying to figure out, you know, what the field is about. You know, it's constantly changing and evolving. So who knows? Maybe there'll be a new data something role in the next five years that they're going to create a data illustrator. Who knows? Um, but <laughs> I think that's great. There's always, you know, more opportunity um, for people. I don't know if you want to type question or unmute. I know not everyone types 90 words a minute like I do. I'll probably butcher it, butcher it but um, 
Soundera, I'm going to go with that. If you have a question, feel free to ask. Freshman master students. I'm a freshman master student specializing in big data. Um, could you tell me what projects to do that would um, help in getting a job after graduation? So, um, really, if you could take some type of, it depends too, and if there's a certain industry that you want to get into. So, if you can, I say the best thing to do is kind of start looking at companies that you think you might be interested in look at the job descriptions, see what types of projects they're working on, see what types of um, tech stack that they're interested in. So if you can start to target that way, um, that can help you. Um, but really the best thing that I've seen is when people can show me examples and they can show me their code and their visuals of some type of project where they've taken you know, a data set. It could be something from the census. It could be at, like any of the free and open source um, places where people publish, um, you know, data sets, take it, do some type of analysis and prediction, and then just do some type of visual on it. So, um, you know, weather data a lot of times is out there for free, and there's also um, data on spending information. So try to look at, you know, some weather data alongside some types of product sales or behavioral characteristics and see what types of you know predictions you could do and then visualize the results. Um, one of my interns who was really successful um, after her internship, she actually developed a website that showcased um, the different projects that she worked on. And I've seen other people do this as well. So not only just making your code available, but making visuals available as well. So you know, graphs and charts of your predictions, you know, maps, if you have it, just something that's really cool, interesting and compelling, you know, that people can go to. But anytime you can um, tailor your project for the type of company that you may be um, interested in, the better. And, you know, sometimes even when you get out, you may see companies that are doing a different tech stack than what you learned, but that doesn't mean that you just say, oh, I can't do it. Once you learn one programming language, you're on your way. Once you learn a second, like you're really starting to get there. As soon as you learn a third language or technology, that's when you've shown that you can learn a fourth or a fifth. That's when you see kind of a difference in being multilingual. So in, in terms of technology. So I would say, you know, again, do your research. Um, try to learn at least a couple different technology stacks and come up with some really cool compelling visuals or a website that people can go to. And then I saw, let's see, do you have any advice for someone pursuing data science and healthcare? Any technologies um, to focus on projects to do? Um, so yes, healthcare, great field to get into. <clears throat> there are, I think if you like free data sets that a lot of times um, people will publish like anonymized um, data sets, anything related to healthcare, medical technology. Um, there's two different areas. There's one just predicting um, based on actual like symptoms or characteristics um, that people have. Like I've done work on connected Bluetooth inhalers, um, data on wearables, and it's taking that data, taking that information and coming up with um, predictions, like when someone's going to have an asthma attack, uh, how many steps people are going to take. So find any data set, <clears throat> excuse me, that's related to a health outcome and see what types of analysis or predictions you can do. The other thing that's really growing is imagery recognition. So if you think about, you know, any type of imagery from MRIs, x-rays, things like that, Doing some type of imagery recognition analysis is also going to be um, really important for the health space. So hopefully those were helpful. I know we're getting close to time, but you can also feel free to message me too. Um, I know I put my uh, LinkedIn um, up on the screen earlier. I recommend it. Uh, and Rosemary, you're someone who's continually sends the elevator back down to help people come back up. So um, I would take that offer up. 
I'm Thanks. really happy to know you. That's what it's all about. I'm not always posting uh, updates on LinkedIn lately. I've been a little bit uh, busy with little man, but um, I'm usually pretty good at responding to messages. <laughs> I'm pretty quick on the message responses. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today, Rosemary. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Have a great day, everyone.